Um, good morning. Um, I would like to welcome everyone at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, Center for Social Sciences, Institute of Legal Studies. Um, the occasion today is, um, is a roundtable discussion on, on the British exit from the European Union, which uh, uh, is called Brexit, I think, by the, by the press and also in, 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 in the political discourse. Um, and we would like to talk about the future of Britain and Europe and all the European Union uh, after the referendum, which took place three weeks ago on a, on a Thursday. Um, I personally was, uh, was shocked. Uh, I'm still very, very much confused. Um, I mean, I, I like the, I like the uh, elation of a, of, a, of a big democratic exercise, but I'm also very sad about the result. I have to say that I'm, I'm, I'm prejudiced. Uh, and I also felt a lot of, uh, lot of, lot of frustration and, um, uh, and anger that obviously affected, because it affected my, my personal view of, of Europe and the, and, the, and the world order. Um, today we have a very exciting panel of, um, of discussions. Um, starting from my right, this is Martin Ugrosdi from the Institute of uh, Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. Uh, and I found out on Tuesday that we have a common friend who also, also works at the, uh, the Center for Social, Social Sciences. Uh, to my right immediately, this is Francesco De Cecco. Um, he's a um, senior lecturer, senior lecturer. Lecturer, lecturer at Newcastle University. He's a lawyer and, um, and an expert in, in EU economic, um, economic, economic law. Uh, to my left, it's uh, Laszlo Andor. He's a professor of economics uh, at the Corvinus Budapest Corvinus University, former member of the European Commission, and uh, he had resided in, in, in England, right? Uh, when times. he was with the EBRD, if I'm, yes. if I'm, if I'm okay, in, in, if I'm right. Uh, this. And then we have uh, Simon Rippon, who's a philosopher. Um, now based at Central European University in Budapest, and uh, he's an Englishman. He's an, he's a, he's an Englishman. Um, so we'd like to start. We would, we, I would like to structure this this roundtable discussion uh, in the following way: We will first talk about Britain. What is going on in Britain in terms of politics, constitutional law, uh, social changes, uh, and so on and so forth? And then we move on to the European issues: policy responses, legal responses, uh, general political political ideas about how Europe and, the Euro and all the European Union should move forward from, uh, from this shock. Uh, because I think it was a shock. Um, I just received a letter from uh, uh, Dame Helen Wallace, who is the, the honorary president of UACS, the uh, United uh, Kingdom Association for European uh, Union Studies. And uh, she said it was a brutal result. The, the referendum, according to her interpretation, was a, was a brutal result. Uh, she's entitled to say this because she started her research in 1960-something, 67, when Charles de Gaulle first vetoed British entry to the, to the European Union, and she was, she was there at the, at the press, press conference. Um, um, and I'm also very much, very much confused about what is, what is happening, uh, what has been happening in, 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 in Britain. Um, so can anyone, can anyone share his opinion, how he, he feels about, about the developments in British politics, British social life, in British, British constitutionalism, uh, that led to the, the events three weeks ago and, and that, are, that are influencing uh, the, the current, current developments uh, in the past couple of, couple of weeks. Um, Simon? Nice was the, Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, thank you. Let me first make a disclaimer, which is uh, um, I'm going to be working on a European Union funded project from, <laughs> from next year. Uh, I'm a, I'm a pro-European. Uh, distraught about uh, the result. It affects my family as an as an expat in British uh, migrants are called expats. Uh, 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 brown migrants are called migrants and refugees. Um, but uh, it affects my family, and uh, and uh, I I think this has been a disaster for the UK, even though it wasn't an entirely unpredictable one. Um, so there, there's a myth being propagated in Hungary that the that the Brexit vote was triggered by the European Union policy of uh, accepting refugees. I know that the government's been pushing that, uh, pushing that line in Hungary. Uh, that's simply not true. The UK has an opt-out from EU migration legislation. Uh, it has an opt-out from Schengen. Uh, it's playing no part in the EU's uh, refugee quota scheme. It never, never agreed to accept any refugees under that scheme. And, and quite simply, refugees were never a main focus of either campaign. They came up Tangentially, there was perhaps a sense of some kind of loss of control in Europe, of political paralysis, but, but really they were never a main focus of the campaign. 
Uh, the campaign was all about migration, but it was about intra-EU migration, um, particularly migration from Eastern Europe. And by the way, there are lots of um, Western European uh, immigrants in Britain, uh, but they're not noticed. It's the Eastern European immigrants that have been uh, that have been noticed and that are the subjects of um, of uh, some hostility that's that's uh, helped to get this um, vote through. Um, so, uh, I, I, I don't know if Martin invited me here mainly for the emotions, uh, 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 opinions, uh, or um, on a professional basis. So, um, I teach um, philosophy at CEU and uh, in the philosophy department in the school, school of Public Policy. And so, uh, two of the things I'm interested in here are the, the, so the, the political philosophy foundations of um, of uh, why this happened and and um, and, uh, and the failures to have um, a, 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 a vibrant debate in the UK about political philosophy, which I think is part of the reason uh, why this has happened, and more generally the public discourse. So, what's what's actually motivated people to to uh, make the decisions that they did? And um, the Leave campaign had a slogan which it repeated endlessly throughout the com campaign, let's take back control. Um, that's a really important slogan, and it came out in two ways. Um, they, they focused on control over our borders, which means control over the numbers of Im immigrants from EU countries, again, mainly from uh, Eastern Europe, and control over British laws being made, uh, as they put it, by unelected bureaucrats, <laughs> like my neighbour here from, 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 from Brussels. Um, notice the slogan is not take control, it's take back control. So there's a bit of nostalgia mixed in there. There's a sense of going back to an earlier time where everything was, was stable and predictable and, and, um, and uh, just right. And uh, there was a huge split between older voters and um, younger voters in the referendum. The younger voters that voted, there was um, about a two-thirds turnout of eligible voters aged 18 to 24. They voted about 75% in uh, favour of remaining in the EU, whereas older voters, uh, s significant over 60s, uh, uh, around about 70% in favour of leaving the EU. So there was a big generational split. And um, I think that the, the referendum campaign is a, is a real demonstration that you can easily um, whip up the sense among the population that they've lost control of something or that they're going to lose control of something. There was a lot of talk about Turkey's joining the EU and Britain having no control over that, which, which, which wasn't necessarily true, about the European Union being a, f a failing economic project, um, about um, uh, moves towards federalisation, which, uh, which supposedly the British uh, wouldn't have been able to um, stop. Um, and it's not the first time in history, Hungarians, I'm sure you'll be aware of this, that, um, that politicians have whipped up a sense of uh, loss of control. Um, and I think it's really important that um, people on, on, on the other side of this debate learn the lessons uh, that the EU has to, sh to show uh, how it gives citizens maximal control over their lives, how a liberal project gives citizens control over their lives. Uh, because um, that argument simply wasn't made during the referendum. The, um, the Remain campaign focused almost entirely on uh, on risks, on, uh, especially on the economic arguments for remaining in the EU. And um, I just, so the, um, there, were, there was a, there's a, a millionaire who bankrolled uh, um, the United Kingdom Independence Party, which was the main driving force between, b behind why the referendum happ uh, happened. And, um, and uh, one of the Leave campaigns, the, uh, uh, Aaron Banks, and he said this after the uh, referendum result. The strategy firm we hired was taking an American-style media approach. What they said early on was facts don't work, and that's it. The Remain campaign, the, the other campaign, featured fact, 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 fact. It just doesn't work. You have to, got to connect with people emotionally. It's the Trump success. Now, to me, as a, Brit, uh, as a Briton, that's a frightening, frightening disclosure. That, that shows a complete failure of British political discourse, and um, and uh, there is a, there's been a real similarity with the way that Trump's campaign is developing in the U.S. 
uh, with the, with the uh, Brexit vote. Um, there have been bold lies. Um, so on the side of the uh, Leave campaign bus, uh, it said, we send £350 million a week to the EU, let's spend it on the NHS instead. Uh, we don't send £350 million a week to the EU. Britain gets uh, a discount uh, called the rebate, so it only sends about £250 million a week, and about half of that comes back uh, as EU funding. Um, more generally, the Leave campaign pushed the idea that we could have our cake and eat it. We could get all the benefits of uh, the single market, of being in the EU, without any of the uh, sacrifices that we have to make in order to be members of a common rulemaking uh, club. Um, and uh, this is also the result of just years and years of anti-EU uh, tabloid press in the UK. So the tabloids are extremely influential. The Sun, uh, Rupert Murdoch's newspaper, is the highest circulation tabloid in Great Britain. Um, it has, it has not, uh, it has backed every winning candidate for prime minister since 1979, and it backed Leave strongly in the EU referendum campaign. So what we've seen in the tabloid press about Europe is not uh, stories about uh, a peaceful project of liberal democracy and the opportunities that that brings, um, but a lot of stories about ridiculous regulations coming from Brussels about how bendy your bananas are allowed to be, um, stories about a character we can call Schrodinger, Schrodinger's immigrant, who's uh, an immigrant who uh, uh, at the same time comes around, comes into Britain to laze around and claim benefits and also steals your job. Uh, and um, stories about how uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, which is in the public mind just the same thing as the EU, um, um, blocks uh, deportation of, of terrorism suspects and, and um, uh, extremist uh, preachers and so on. Um, so uh, there's been a kind of a, um, a story that's come out after the referendum that this is about economic deprivation, that, that, um, that, that, there been a, that there's a working class um, um, a group in Britain that's been um, neglected and that this is um, some kind of economic backlash. It's, it's, it, it's all about um, neglected areas and, and um, 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 places where uh, the manufacturing industry is, has uh, been destroyed by globalization. And um, that's partly true, but I think there's something that's much more importantly uh, true, is to note that uh, unemployment is currently running at 5% in Britain. It's at a 10-year low. Um, um, and there's, that, there's, uh, that there's a better correlation of Leave voters with support for the death penalty than there is with wealth. So support for bringing back the death penalty correlates better with Leave voting than, than individual wealth. Um, and um, I think a lot of the roots of this vote are not in, uh, in economic hardship, but in social conservatism, which of course correlates to some extent uh, with uh, the working class. There's a uh, there's a sense, which has been again fostered by the tabloids, that uh, there's uh, this thing, that there's this social progress, there's this political conservatism, uh, sorry, political correctness, uh, which has gone mad in public life. And you can't say things that are obviously, that are commonsensically true anymore. You, ca you can't make uh, your own judgments. Uh, there are people coming, there are sort of liberals coming in with rules telling you what to do all the time. Um, and um, that, uh, the, uh, there's an anti-political correctness group of voters, and they've been losing consistently for years, and they're, and they're mad about that, and they're angry about that. And I think it's those people that uh, wanted to take back control. So this is not about economic rewards, but it's the sense that they've lost control over policy and they want it back. And um, can I just say one more thing? Yes, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, t I'm taking a long time. <laughs> um, but, but the way to respond to this is not to pump more money into, uh, into those areas, but to start to have a real debate about what it is to have control over our lives and to have control over our communities. There are people who are losing their social identity because their communities are changing, because with an influx of immigrants, uh, things have changed, and they don't necessarily like that change. And it's easy to blame things on... Um, outsiders. But the right to control the makeup of your community and what languages it speaks, the right to exclude 
um, in order to have the people around you that you want around you. Well, that's a matter for political philosophy to debate. That's, a, that's something we should have a real debate about. Should we have a right to exclude because um, uh, we don't like um, the fact that the people around us may not share a common uh, culture and history anymore or a common uh, language? Um, that's a, you know, that's a, the classic debate between communitarian goods and individual uh, liberty. That debate did not happen around Brexit. And it hasn't happened in Britain for many years. I think Britain's become complacent about its liberal values. Um, so, no, I, I love these I, ideas. I, I, I love, the, love these ideas. Um, um, so, Matt, what's, what's the Hungarian view of, 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 of the British, British politics that surrounded Brexit? What's, what's, your, what's, what's your opinion on, on that as, a, as an expert on... Well, uh, that's a good question because I wouldn't say that we have been so much consistent um, to some extent. On the one hand, of course, the official standpoint of the government was that we would like to see a happy and content and successful United Kingdom within the European Union. That did not happen, at least during the vote, even though the Hungarian Prime Minister placed an advertisement in one of the most well-circulated tabloids, by the way, just days before the referendum day. But right now, we have a situation to solve, and um, it's a little bit problematic, I would say, in a sense that many of, the, uh, uh, many of the goals of the British government regarding EU reform were shared by the Hungarian government. And by the way, it was shared by lots of other EU member states as well, uh, who wanted better regulation, who wanted more competitiveness, who wanted uh, less powers transferred to Brussels. And uh, with the United Kingdom gone, the Hungarian government and some other governments, like the one in Denmark or in the Netherlands, will lose one of the key allies and one of the biggest member states of the European Union in this uh, quest. Of course, this is a political fight on the European level, whether we would like to have a more federal Europe uh, or a Europe of nation states. I really would not like to get into this right now because it leads to somewhere else. But maybe we can come to, back to that in the Q&A. But obviously, on the political level, we have a problem right now because one of our most significant allies is gone. On the other hand, there's a more significant issue which affects basically, well, not every family, but most of the families in Hungary, and those are the Hungarian people living and working in the United Kingdom. And number one problem with that is that we do not have reliable data on how many people live there, what, they, what are they doing, whether they're working, whether they're claiming benefits, whether they are uh, exploiting the British welfare state, uh, as some like to say it. So uh, to a large extent, we lack information on which we can base uh, either government decisions or uh, scientific research uh, as well. So there's anecdotal evidence that, let's say, London is the second biggest Hungarian city, but nobody actually knows how many Hungarians are living there. And uh, uh, the Hungarian Central Statistics Office have some data on that, but I have some doubts whether it's reliable. And also there's uh, data from the British Social Security, but those numbers are regarded much lower, as the anecdotal evidence would suggest. So there's a lot of confusion about this. But, of course, one of the main objectives of the Hungarian government, I think, would be to protect the rights of those Hungarians living in the UK because they did not give up their uh, citizenship. So the Hungarian government is also responsible for them. And because uh, they can also vote on Hungarian elections, uh, they will reach out for their votes and try to protect their interests as well. I think uh, what would be the toughest job right now is to represent the interests of not only uh, Hungary but the Central European countries who send lots of uh, workers to the UK and of course the most significant and the most important is Poland in this case. So uh, I would be really interested to see that what the so-called Visegrad uh, group uh, could work out to provide an answer and provide some uh, inputs for the debate that's going to take place on the European level and how the divorce between the UK and the EU will take place and what the details will be because I think that's the most important problem we're facing right now that nobody actually knows what is going to happen. No, uh, we do not even know that when Article 50 will be triggered. Uh, I just read some articles before I came in here that uh, uh, David Davis just said that uh, they will not trigger it before the end of the year. 
and they have some other ideas on their table like concluding trade agreements with, uh, with other countries so to provide for a, for a cushion for the UK uh, during the divorce but there's still so much unpredictability and the government is brand new Theresa May was sworn in just yesterday so she's still announcing her cabinet so it's right now I think it's a wait and see approach and uh, I do not think that uh, the Central European countries will be major players in this debate because uh, if you look at the European Union, and I know it's really not about the UK right now, uh, the most important economic interests are live with Germany and France to a large extent. And uh, even though we might have lots of people actually living in the UK, and uh, for that instance, one of my family members is also living in the UK and working there, so there's a disclaimer about that right now. But uh, it's not really uh, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban dealing the cards in Brussels. It's rather Angela Merkel and François Hollande. And we will see that, let's say, if uh, the Brexit talks will take place during a two-year period or even more, as it is rumored, what is going to happen in the meantime to President Hollande, for example, because his popularity rating are not so high and he's facing elections next year. So unpredictability, I think, is the, is the key word during the Brexit talks. And I think I'll stop here okay. and okay. give floor to okay. the others. So Francesco, what's the view from, from the north of England, uh, one mm. of the most deprived areas of, uh, of, that, of that wealthy country? Um, yes, I, I should say, for a start, I'll put in a disclaimer as well, I, I am a dual national Italian and, and British, so I did vote in, in the referendum, and you can imagine the way I voted. I also teach European Union law at Newcastle University, so I have a direct uh, pulse of the situation in an area of uh, the country uh, that has the highest levels of uh, social economic political <laughs> relation. Um, in fact, it was the bellwether of the referendum. I was watching uh, the referendum results as they were yeah, unveiled throughout the night on the 23rd and Newcastle was one of the first. Now Newcastle is a, has a large student population, it has, it, it, it's, it has a social demographic uh, composition that's a bit different from the rest of the North East. Um, and the result there was expected to be a, a large win for the Remain campaign. Instead it was a very slight majority for the Remain campaign, and that uh, ran. Uh, alarm bells started uh, ringing after that result was uh, revealed. And shortly after that, another city in the northeast, Sunderland, uh, which is the seat of uh, probably one of the largest uh, car plants in Europe that exports 80% you know, of its cars to, to the European Union, uh, Nissan, 60% um, of uh, voters voted to leave the European Union. They're also, Sunderland is also a major beneficiary of European funds, of course, development funds. Um, it also has a very low level of migration. So uh, these are very puzzling results for everyone. Why is, in particular, the Sunderland result was extremely uh, uh, partly because of the reasons that I said, low levels of migration and yeah, an export economy and manufacturing. One of the few parts of the UK that's actually export-led and a major beneficiary, net beneficiary of European funds. So how do we answer that puzzle? It's very difficult to tell, but the, the most plausible answer is that it was a protest vote uh, due to a, a long uh, standing deep-seated grievances that uh, date back to the devastation caused that's by some of the policies that were embarked upon in the 1980s, uh, where you know, the, and the effects of globalization. So the most perhaps persuasive narrative is that there are a number of different issues that uh, conspire to produce that result, including the fact that uh, uh, there is a large part of the electorate that took this referendum as a chance to vent their frustration at the political class 
uh, the frustration towards the lack of concern showed by the political class towards their issues, issues uh, to do with public services, the impact of the welfare cuts, so-called austerity policies uh, of recent years that the Conservative government has introduced uh, in the last uh, five years at least. Um, so there is a a number of there were a number of, of different concerns that played to uh, their uh, result that produced this result. Um, how to answer these concerns now that uh, European uh, that the UK has left uh, well hasn't left yet but is going to withdraw from the European Union uh, and now that it is not part of the uh, largest trading bloc in the world and arguably the only way for uh, uh, you know, the issues that uh, were of, of um, uh, concern to, to, uh, to this part of the electorate the only way to address these issues arguably is through the European Union European Union is the only way in which progressive policies social protection policies can be advanced in a globalized context. Uh, isolationism is not going to work. I am particularly puzzled by parts of the left that promoted a vote leave. It's a minority of the left, but still a vocal minority. And they promoted this idea that the European Union is a so-called neoliberal <coughs> organization. But what they fail to mention is that it is only neoliberal insofar as the UK has pressed for it to become neoliberal and has convinced the other partners, the other member states, the other governments to dilute social protection policies, environmental protection policies, and, and so on. So by leaving the European Union is not going to... Uh, suddenly turn the UK into a socialist paradise. That is not going to happen. The most likely outcome is that those policies will even be you know, exa exacerbated. Of course, that's not what the government is saying at the moment. Uh, uh, Theresa May has, uh, uh, has stated her intention to be a one-nation Conservative Party, in other words, to introduce... Uh, policies that uh, will address the concerns of, of the working classes. But with the, uh, the economic, the likely economic impact of withdrawal due to the uncertainty uh, is going to frustrate any social policies that, uh, or the funding for the social policies that the government uh, uh, seems to want to introduce. So there's a, a lot of confusion and what is also extremely puzzling, apart from the, the way in which the campaign was conducted, it is that there is somehow a belief that the UK now can trade with the world, sign lots of international trade agreements with the UK, with the United States, and then go back to the EU and say, look, We've got all these uh, trade agreements. They are you know, incredibly wide-ranging. We've only done it in two years. Now give us what we wanted in the first place, which is access to the single market and no free movement of people. And they actually believe that that's going to happen. This is going to be very interesting. I mean, I, I, I really um, want to see the moment when... Mr. Davis, who is now the secretary, newly appointed secretary of state for exiting the European Union, as it's called, uh, will uh, 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 come to the table with, uh, with this proposition. I w just want to see the faces, the reaction of uh, the other governments when that happens. Thank you. Um, Professor Andor, um, what's, the, what's the view from, from, from the perspective of, of experts? Experts who have worked with the Commission, worked with international intergovernmental organisations like the EBRD, 
uh, and that's um, you know, the economics of, uh, of free trade and, uh, and then common, common markets. Well, as you mentioned experts, this is also a very important part of this uh, recent campaign uh, because uh, Michael Goff, who was one of the leading uh, politicians on the Leave side, he once said in a discussion that we had enough of experts. Um, and he said it because um, a, a large amount of experts, uh, especially economists, but also lawyers and others, uh, were indeed uh, providing estimates about uh, the economic implication, the potential economic and social consequences of uh, Brexit. And since there was really a wide consensus among economists, whether they are monetarist or Keynesian or whatever type of economist, that this is going to be bad uh, for Britain. Uh, the Daily Telegraph published a big um, advert signed by many Nobel Prize winners and non-Nobel Prize winners. Um, uh, and and this, this, is, was, this was deliberately ignored. So indeed, um, the, the game was about something else. It was not about a fair uh, presentation of the two alternatives to uh, the British uh, public. Um, you used the word in the introduction, uh, a shock. I think it is probably a shock, especially what concerns uh, the economy. Um, but I think shock doesn't necessarily mean that this was an entirely unexpected uh, outcome, because uh, if you look at the long history of uh, uh, British-EU relations um, in the recent decades, especially since the early 1990s, you have seen that uh, uh, it, it, has ne it has never been a very easy relationship. In fact, um, since uh, the time of the Maastricht Treaty, the UK built for itself inside the European Union a kind of semi-detached uh, position. The semi-detached position was institutional, legal, um, many opt-outs, but it was also emotional. Um, a lot of British people uh, never really converged on European identity, European values. Um, Britain uh, you know, remained outside the metric uh, world um, in, in all you know, possible implications of, uh, of, of this. And, um, and that, of course, um, would have resulted in um, a similar vote if it had been held uh, previously. Uh, so there are many, many people, especially on the conservative side, who would have voted against the European Union, even if this referendum had taken place 10 years or 20 years uh, before. Uh, the party political divide indeed is very interesting because um, there are practically three axes uh, which explain the attitudes of the British electorate, how they arrived uh, to this conclusion. One of them was age, very clearly. The more older population was more anti-European, uh, maybe with some memories of the war, and, um, uh, and the younger people, uh, some of them with the Erasmus experience, um, and enjoying the benefits of the free movement, including to the Sigat Festival, uh, they might have been more pro-European. Um, and the other one was education. Uh, more higher educational education attainment was linked with, uh, with more pro-European views, less education with more anti-European. And indeed, the party political is very interesting because the Conservative Party uh, had <coughs> about a 50-50 share between uh, those who followed Mr. Cameron, um, uh, who wanted to stay in the European Union, and those who wanted to follow Mr. Johnson, who at some point wanted to uh, leave. More leave, more leave even than that, I think. Maybe at the end it shifted towards the leave. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So the, 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 in, I agree, this was a critical issue. Maybe when the campaign started in early spring, it was a 50-50, and it just shows that Mr. Johnson was more a kind of uh, powerful campaigner uh, together with a few others than the Prime Minister, who changed his rhetoric completely, and I think it cost him his credibility until February. His language was entirely Eurosceptic, um, echoing a lot of the tabloid press uh, 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 cliches about uh, the European Union. But once he had his compromise in the European Council and started to campaign, uh, he suddenly became a, a, a pro-European. So, of course, there's a question of credibility here, which uh, the electorate surely noticed. But indeed, the Labour Party, uh, which is the other major party in the UK, uh, was not entirely united, but the shares were different. So it was about a two-thirds, one-third uh, uh, division among the Labour voters, 
and and we already heard especially uh, how it has been happening in the in the north of England when um, there were many uh, districts um, industrial or former industrial towns uh, with the labor inclination but uh, but uh, uh, turning gradually against um, a, a European orientation. I'm saying it's not exactly unexpected. A couple of years ago, Anthony Giddens, a former director of the London School of Economics, came to Brussels to speak about his new book about the European Union. And um, indeed, already at that time, when um, uh, Mr. Cameron was already playing with the idea of um, uh, the referendum, um, uh, Anthony Giddens uh, uh, concluded that it can very well happen that um, the UK would sleepwalk out of the European mm -hmm. Union without the people actually knowing what it means and what the consequences uh, 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 might be. And since uh, uh, the, the, the Remain campaign indeed only focused on, um, uh, on, on the risk of leaving, instead of uh, trying to make a positive argument about um, EU uh, membership, at the end it became less convincing uh, than, uh, than, than the Leave campaign, which was, I would say, more uh, comprehensive, complex and, uh, and emotional. So um, we have to, I think, uh, accept this as a democratic decision. We have to live uh, uh, on both sides of the channel um, with uh, the consequences of, uh, of, uh, of this decision. Um, I think we should also appreciate that the 27 other members of the European Union made a big effort to keep the United Kingdom in uh, the EU. Um, Mr. Cameron had four requests, and on all four points, uh, very concrete things were given to Mr. Cameron, and especially this region, whose workers uh, went in recent years since enlargement in large numbers to the UK, uh, the government indeed accepted the material sacrifice um, um, in, in form of social benefits uh, and also possible restrictions of the free movement um, in the form of a kind of emergency break. So these are very concrete uh, uh, concessions that have been made. Um, of course, with this referendum, referendum result, uh, nothing is valid out of that, absolutely nothing is valid. So if um, uh, uh, the UK uh, wanted to uh, kind of return to some of this, of course, completely newly, they have to start new negotiation, right? And if the UK leaves uh, uh, at the end of um, this procedure, uh, the European Union, and at some point British people would change their mind and they would want to return, they would have no opt-out from the single currency, no opt-out from Schengen, no opt-out from the Working Time Directive, because just like anyone else, they would need to accept the Arctic Communitaire. Um, let me just finish with one point, because it was also said that in the propaganda against uh, EU membership, it was mentioned that uh, uh, the EU is a failing economy. Um, the EU is not a failing economy, but it, the EU has a failing monetary unit. The EU has a failing single currency. And um, the Eurozone crisis indeed contributed to the anti-European sentiment, uh, not only to the sentiment, uh, but of course uh, uh, to, let's say, the immigration challenge uh, to, of, 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 of Great Britain. Because in fact, in the recent years, um, it's not the Poles uh, whose numbers <coughs> increased in the UK, but the Spanish and the Italian. Uh, those who came from the crisis countries of, uh, of, uh, of the Eurozone. And um, uh, however stupid these targets were uh, to reduce um, uh, the number of um, immigrants uh, aggressively um, uh, to, to the UK, um, of course the Eurozone crisis made it harder uh, to deliver on uh, these promises, um, which should not have been made, but once they were made, uh, the government should have seen that they have no tools uh, to, to fulfill uh, these, these uh, uh, promises. So it's true that um, uh, in many cases uh, the Leave campaign, whether it was Johnson or Michael Howard, former Conservative leader, they could point to the Eurozone crisis to say that, look, you know, Europe is uh, uh, not working. Uh, but the point is that the British government 
of Mr. Cameron never really wanted to help uh, to sort out uh, the Eurozone uh, crisis. In fact, they were helping the German government to block the necessary reforms of um, the monetary uh, union, which would have helped a faster recovery and um, the creation of a more sustainable and uh, resilient um, uh, structure. So, you know, the, the, the situation obviously requires uh, a, a deep and comprehensive analysis. Um, you don't have just one issue or one point um, uh, at stake. It's, 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 it's quite a complex, but um, it's probably less complex than the way ahead. Hmm. Thank you very much. Um, before we move on to the EU issues, just, just have one quick round on, on this one particular <coughs> dilemma I, I have. When I, when I try to interpret the vote, yeah? I had I came up with two p possible explanations. That this was first, it was a completely internal political affair in Britain. It's about it's, it's a Tory discourse. It's a Tory party hijacking a, a national political discourse. Uh, the Tory Tory parties factions fighting against each other uh, uh, came to be a national issue, which uh, which uh, which then uh, influenced uh, this this important decision. Uh, the decision reflects uh, the polarization of British society. Uh, it reflects that Britain is indeed a troubled country because of its uh, its post Second World War history, and certainly since the the post 9/11 history, Britain engaged in two wars, both of which were lost by Britain, I suppose, uh, both Afghanistan and, and Iraq. If you, if you if you want to say this, the economic and and, um, and and financial crisis shook the British economy. It was a huge shock to the, to the British economy, which is an open economy. And the other interpretation, which has been touched upon, is, is anti-globalization sentiments or anti-regionalization sentiments. Uh, the very strong sense of nostalgia, what, what Simon mentioned uh, regarding the slogan of taking, taking back control. New sovereignism, sovereignism, sovereignism itself uh, being an agenda uh, which uh, uh, would see nation states as, as being the, you know, the solid entities that are able to weather the pressures of, 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 of globalization. Um, so in a sense, I, I see a, a very, very local problem, very, very local problem, very local political discourse being elevated to the European European level and having an impact in Budapest, in everywhere in Europe. Or the second one, second potential explanation that that we're dealing with one of the first expressions of anti-globalization, anti-regionalization sentiments, obviously fueled by the by the European handling of the. Of the, of the of the eurozone 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 crisis. So, what, what's your views on, on, on this? Shall we start again, Simon? Is this is this a, is this a British issue, or is that is that um, part of a much more uh, larger discontent with with regionalisation and well, look, uh, the, the referendum happened purely because of a domestic political fight, a domestic threat to the to to David Cameron and the Conservative Party. So, he wanted to. Uh, stop the, the 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 pull from the right wing of his party, which has been anti-European for a long time, and has. Uh, and by the way, the European question has brought down the last three British prime ministers, not just David Cameron, because of the right wing of the Conservative Party, um, and uh, and the rising threat of the uh, of UKIP. Um, so the reason why the referendum happened was certainly domestic. Um, is it an anti-globalization vote? Um, so I, I think it, it, it is that, but in a cultural that rather than an economic sense, that's what the protest vote is about. Um, people in Britain weren't really concerned about uh, people in Spain and um, Greece and Italy. They were actually largely unaware of Spanish, Greek, Italian immigrant immigration to Britain. They were worrying about Poles because there, there, there have been large num numbers of Polish EU citizens in Britain for a long time. Um, and um, again, I think it's a protest vote about, about communities changing without consent. This is, what, you know, this is part, part, partly explains the, the age split in the vote. Um, now, it was said that um, the, the British haven't taken on, haven't uh, identified with European values. Um, here are some values. Democracy, rule of law, individual liberty, mutual respect, tolerance for those with different faiths and beliefs. Do they sound like European values to you? These values were introduced into the British National Curriculum in 2014. Uh, the reason why they were introduced is uh, because there was concern 
that there were some Muslim schools in Britain which were not, um, uh, which were not uh, doing a, a good job of integrating um, their uh, students into society, and uh, they were labelled not European values but British values. <laughs> so we see a kind of nationalistic labelling of really universal values of liberal democracy, but they're, they're, they're no longer understood as part of a political project in Britain. And I think that's a fundamental uh, problem here. So it's, it's, it's anti-globalisation in the, in the cultural sense. It's not an anti-neoliberalism as such, although that gets blamed for a lot of things. But it's the sense that we've got no control over, over the values that guide political life anymore. The politicians aren't listening to us. Why aren't they listening to us? People do not understand why there are constraints on the control they have over the nature of their community. Matt, do you have any views on this, this issue? Uh, on the first point, I pretty much agree with Simon uh, in a way that uh, when I first saw the idea of the referendum, it was floated around by David Cameron saying that if he wins the next election and if he can govern alone, he will have the referendum. Unfortunately for him, both things happened. And uh, of course, there is no way to backtrack from this promise. And I think this is uh, what they call unforced error in tennis, in a way that it was completely unnecessary to, to some extent. And instead of going down in history as uh, being prime minister during a great economic uh, prosperity of Great Britain, he will go down as one of the most dumbest prime ministers, basically ousting himself from power with such a, uh, well, I dare to say stupid question. But anyway, uh, I think it was completely a local issue. Uh, and as just, just as Simon said, he wanted to get this issue off his table during those uh, four years that he, had, he was supposed to have left in power because he already announced that he's not going to run for prime minister in 2020. And it would have been good for him to not, uh, be, uh, not being forced to talk about European issues to a large extent. Uh, on the other hand, about globalization, I think it's really interesting to see that uh, it's still very hard to sell the European Union within the European Union. So what is the EU and why do we need it is a question which is still unanswered in, in many member states. Even though if you look at the Eurobarometer surveys, uh, public support for the European Union is much higher than you would su uh, suspect from uh, the rhetorics and announcements of different governments across Europe. So uh, basically there's disconnect in that. And, uh, Boris Johnson and Donald Trump are quite often linked in a way that they're, uh, they're the representatives of a new form of populism, which is, uh, uh, which is forming the politics of nowadays. It's really interesting to see that, just as we discussed, that educational attainment, age, social status are the things which are uh, determining whether the, Brits, the Britons have voted for uh, remain or leave. On the other hand, on the other side of the Atlantic, you will see that the very same or very similar groups, uh, people who have lost their jobs because of globalization, who do not feel that they have control over the, uh, over the future of their communities, who feel disconnected from the political elite, are moving in the same direction. And uh, this is uh, coming to surface uh, in other European countries as well. Not only, not only the UK, if you look at France, for example, if you look at the Nordic countries, if you look at uh, the Netherlands to, to some extent, just to name a few countries which have been member states of the European Union for a longer time, we will see that this is a challenge which runs unanswered. And at this time, I really do not feel that mainstream parties are up for the challenge to provide credible answers for this. And one of the reasons, for example, the uh, migration slash refugee issue was uh, handled this way was that mainstream parties were not ready to provide credible answers. And this is when uh, the political elite and the, pop the larger part of the population uh, parted ways. And this, in my opinion, and this is really my personal opinion, this is what have uh, led to the situation we're facing right now. Uh, very briefly, uh, yes, the, the referendum was uh, uh, called for internal political or internal party reasons within the Conservative Party. But of course, uh, the uh, perception of the European Union and the, the fact that the European Union doesn't 
at the moment have a clear positive message to send to European citizens didn't help. I'm not saying that there isn't such a message. Of course, we all know that European Union is the way in which we can make globalization work for European citizens. But that message doesn't come across, and the Eurozone crisis clearly didn't help, and the devastation that it has caused, and the way in which it was mishandled. Um, I, I don't want to go back to that, but it is true that, that it was, that, that the Eurozone crisis was used instrumentally in their referendum campaign. Uh, not only Boris Johnson, Michael, but also Gisela Stewart, who was the only Labour uh, representative of, of the Leave uh, campaign, used Greece. She kept going on about Greece, even though the UK is not part of the Eurozone. Uh, but of course, the, the, the mis mishandling of the Eurozone crisis is patent. It's, uh, it's there for everyone to see. So it, the European Union doesn't send a positive message. There is a deep crisis and and uh, the referendum hopefully will spur uh, <clears throat> national politicians into action because that's the problem. It's the problem is with the governments. We can't separate the European Union from the national governments. That's the false narrative that politicians in the UK and in other countries, I won't mention which countries, uh, because there are most countries in fact, uh, have been peddling the, the fact that Europe is something, European Union is something that happens to us, that is inflicted on us. You know, they always fail to mention that they, they actually, their governments are actually the ones who are taking the decisions. So perhaps we can come back to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so. Yes, the European Union is often used as a scapegoat. It can be a universal scapegoat for whatever uh, adversity. You can uh, blame it because um, it cannot compete uh, with the sun or other newspapers. Um, the, in, in, in the concrete case of the UK, um, the EU representation in London established a website in order to provide facts and, and a kind of explanation for many things which have been um, uh, uh, presented or mispresented in British media, um, this is visited by a few thousand people. And then a few million people obviously read uh, The Sun or other newspapers. So there's no um, real competition between these things. So if you want to portray the European Union through the poor Romanians uh, who might be begging on Oxford Street, you can do that. Um, without too many uh, consequences. Um, and nobody really speaks about the importance of the European Union to settle uh, the UK's relations with Ireland. Without EU membership for both the United Kingdom and uh, the Republic of Ireland, this would not have been possible. And the Scottish question and Gibraltar, um, practically for any country in Europe, let's be honest, um, uh, neighborship, neighborhood uh, relations um, um, uh, have been settled with enormous help of uh, uh, the European Union membership. It's not only a Franco-German issue. Yes, that's the origin. Uh, but in many, many other cases, um, the EU membership helped uh, to sort out uh, issues or, or, or conflicts um, uh, between neighbors, the latest being perhaps Slovenia and Croatia, uh, uh, which also had uh, uh, border uh, disputes. Uh, so this is, uh, let's say, the political benefits of an economic cooperation and integration um, were not really uh, discussed in this campaign or in, or in the previous uh, decades, although a lot of people are aware of uh, this, of course. Uh, the other point is that, indeed, um, uh, as an economist, you know, for, forgive me to you know, come back to the issue of, let's say, the economic background and, and the origin of the fact. Um, a very important fact uh, to start with, which also non-economists should know, that uh, for the 20th century, a key question um, has, uh, was um, a key fact that British uh, economic productivity grew much slower than German, right? And it had many consequences. Uh, the main consequence and manifestation is that sterling had to be repeatedly devalued, first against gold, and then against dollar, and then against uh, Deutschmark, and then against the euro. Uh, uh, but the, the key point always has been uh, the, the relative uh, weakness of uh, the British uh, economic and especially manufacturing 
uh, power uh, as compared to the continent. And this, of course, explains why uh, Britain decided to stay out of the monetary union, because you cannot have a fixed exchange rate forever if you can't uh, change this fact that productivity is not growing fast enough. You would have had a different school system, a more egalitarian uh, school system, access to quality education, vocational training, uh, in, in very wide layers of society in order to come to the German level of uh, productivity uh, growth and more balanced economic development, but this is a domestic issue. Neither Brussels nor anyone else can force the British government to change the economic model. Instead of that, the British economy flourished in the European Union because it was allowed to be outside the monetary union and because some key sectors, the City of London, financial services and higher education were allowed to perform to full potential uh, because of a European single market and European policies, which were also pumping money to British universities for education, research, uh, uh, student mobility, teachers mobility, and all, all, all the rest of that. So uh, it has been a customized uh, position. But uh, these uh, competitive advantages, City of London, higher education, plus military, are the ones which are typically not trickling down. So a trickle down theory is problematic in general, but it's particularly problematic if you want uh, to expect a trickle down effect from financial services or, um, or, um, or, or the higher education or the military. So uh, the, much of the kind of social failure uh, which is behind a high level of leave vote, especially in the north or the non-metropolitan areas, of Britain are linked to this type of economic uh, development and of course the question is whether Britain has a better chance uh, to repair uh, this economic model outside uh, the European Union. I'm personally very doubtful. Okay. Okay. Um, before we move on to the EU issues, um, Shall we collect a number of short, very short questions or comments from, from the audience? You can direct your question to uh, the member of the panel, member of the panel, or, or your comment. Is there is there any anybody wishing to interfere, or shall we move on with our discussion? Anyone? Yes. Um, I have one question. Uh, one of the any of the panelists can answer, but I would direct direct it towards uh, Professor Ugroshi. Uh, you mentioned that there tends to be within these countries that have Eurosceptic rhetoric, there tends to be high levels of public support for the EU. What do you think is the main driving factor for this? And why does this exist? Just as Commissioner uh, Anders said, the EU is a very easy scapegoat to score easy political goals. And basically, I think that's one of the major points because uh, there's a saying that all of the benefits of the EU are claimed by the national governments and all of the problems associated with the EU are uh, pushed on Brussels. And I think this tells it pretty much. And if, even if you look at Central Europe, you will see that the governments are perfectly aware of the fact that how much money they get from the European Union, and how important that money is to keep their own uh, business and political interests going. And because of that, you know, there, there have been rumors that uh, there would be similar referendums of uh, EU exits in different Central and Eastern European countries. I don't think that's true. I mean, it's a, it's a good newspaper headline. It, it sells your daily issue. It gets lots of clicks on your website. But economically and also personally on the leadership level, it doesn't make any sense because of, uh, because of the web of uh, various business interests built around uh, European funds. Of course, in the case of Britain, it's different because they were net contributors, but we're net beneficiaries. So the game is completely different. Yeah, just one short question. Uh, Professor uh, Seko was talking about uh, uh, the protest voting in case of this uh, uh, citizen in modern England. Uh, what, what was against? The protest against what? Uh, that's a very good question there. Uh, and as with uh, every protest vote, it's difficult to pin down the exact target. But the generic target is the establishment. So the uh, campaign to remain within the European was perceived as the point of view of the establishment. 
which to, to an extent is true because the, uh, the, 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 the government, well, the majority in the government was uh, obviously a campaigning in favor of remaining the city of London. All the economic interests were almost unanimous in, in supporting the Remain campaign. So this was perceived as the establishment view. So the protest was against the establishment. The local, so there was a local context. UK context, but it was all as often happens in, in, in these, uh, um, on these occasions, it was all mixed up, or different issues were mixed up. And also you have to bear in mind, I think we've, this has already been touched on, but the way in which um, political campaigns have evolved is that most people, and we know that people are now bombarded with information from various sources, so they don't have time to focus as used to be, you know, the time when people used to read broadsheet newspapers. Uh, they had, don't have the time to focus on, on the news and to uh, delve more deeply into their issues. They only get these you know, sound bites, take back control uh, of our borders, take back control of our country. That's a very simple message and it worked. And that, that was associated with a process against the establishment. Uh, you talked already a lot about the power of uh, populist campaigns, uh, indeed, in this, in this world. Uh, are there any ongo ongoing uh, research in political science uh, uh, that uh, we can already uh, talk about, maybe, or, or can we expect any scientific results in political science on this? Um, uh, how, how can we measure the, the influence of the, this uh, populist uh, campaign at all in, in the world? So what do you expect uh, with regard to the scientific analysis of this, um, of the influence of and the power of the, uh, the campaign? I wish I could say more on this. All I can say is uh, CEU was, uh, had a summer school on political populism uh, just last week. Um, so the experts in that uh, w will have been there, um, but not not my field, I'm afraid. Populism. I, I can't say that I'm an expert on 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 populism. I, I'm a I'm a lawyer. I, I'm aware of the fact that that there has been research on the attitudes towards the European and populism in the various member states of the European. This has been the case for. Uh, decades now, but I can't say that I'm an expert in, in this field. Uh, I think, t to me, the crucial issue is how the media ma manipulation and the new media manipulation uh, reacts with, with this, with this ongoing movement, your know, long-standing movement. And that's, to me, that's, uh, from, to my mind, that, that is the most important evolution in recent times. But I'm not an expert. I can't claim <laughs> to, to have an expertise in here. Well, I think populism will be the sexiest topic of uh, the next couple of years. Uh, so uh, those researching the far right might have some tough time in uh, attracting research funds. But um, it's, being, it's being studied even though populism remains an elusive concept. So nobody actually knows what it is. Uh, there's a good saying that we call populists, uh, we call those politicians populists who are popular, but we do not like them. So we need a better definition than that, even though we do not necessarily have one right now. Thank you. Uh, I have rather a comment and a question. So um, many of you said that uh, the Remain campaign mostly focused on the facts, facts, and facts. And uh, this was a major problem because it uh, also meant that voters couldn't uh, emotionally bond with the Remain uh, arguments. So I think that, that uh, if we accept this statement, um, this may have very, very serious consequences regarding to what we think about the democratic decision-making process as uh, such. And this was the comment. And uh, the question is rather that, OK, if, uh, we also accept that the EU is not capable of bonding emotionally with its voters, with, with the citizens of the EU. So if there is a lack of uh, real European political discourse and there is a lot of, uh, how to say, it, re re real European political community. So what could we do with this problem? Is it a possibility to somehow build up a real European political community with 
I don't know, for example, with the help of real European political parties or something like that. But does anyone want to quick response? I mean, can I, can I comment back on your comment? Uh, <laughs> I think one of the reasons why EU membership should be, you know, hammered into the uh, constitutions that this is a, a non-referendum issue uh, is, is because, you know, to avoid these sort of upsets. I mean, I understand that, that, that the Leave vote was more successful than the Remain vote, but, uh, I mean, if you look at, look at the British society is, is divided in the middle, I suppose, yeah? even if you take, take into account the different age groups and, and, and all the rest. And then you have these sort of divisions that you know, 100,000, you know, maybe let's say 100,000, 20,000 people want something more than, than the rest. Uh, I'm not sure that that's actual basis to, you know, to steer your country away from, from something. And I think this is one of the big issues with British constitutionalism, that you can't actually you know, put, put something into the constitutional text that, that, that just cannot be changed the next day you know, through, 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 through Parliament. Maybe the German system is, is, uh, is more developed to, to, to handle these sort of issues. I mean, I understand that emotions are important and, and the people have expressed their, their intentions, but uh, it's also important that, uh, that we... we I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying any con anything controversial, but uh, I, I do share the views of, of, of Jean Monnet that, uh, that, you know, that, that trade in Europe, okay, trade in common policy in Europe might not be ready for... You know, for, for complete democratic control. I'm not expressing anti-democratic views, but uh, but I share his personal feelings about uh, about the importance of, of you know of. Yes, yeah, but it is a very very sad picture. Yes, it is a very sad picture. I mean, European European scholarship, European Union scholarship has been dealing with this issue. Shall we introduce more democracy, more values into the European? How can how can we say to citizens? Very lot of critical voices from, from the left, critical voices from mainstream academia. But Europe has been responding to it. I mean, subsidiarity, social regulation, uh, areas like state aid law or, 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 or public services. There's a lot of response being given, but you know, it's, it's very difficult to communicate all that, I suppose. Yeah, it's uh, how do you communicate that? By that? national governments, and then the national governments take the credit for yes. everything. So this is the problem. So that's why I think that perhaps there should be a real political discourse with perhaps with real European political parties. But the European real, real European po political parties in the European Parliament are anti-European. There's a big majority of. Well, that's that's a very legitimate point point of view. I mean, I'm I'm worried about European policies. Are you worried about European policies? Some of them they're very dangerous. They're very very dangerous. For example, uh, free movement of services is very is a very, can be a very dangerous uh, policy. Um, it, it can change. It can change industries in a way I might not be comfortable with. Um, yeah. So I, I think that's an excellent, really excellent question. I, I think it's one that we should really, really be focused on. By the way, the description of the uh, Remain campaign as fat, 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 and the Leave campaign as um, connecting with emotions <laughs> was the description of a Leave campaign. I say of, of a you know a backer, a main backer of the Leave campaign. So it's not something that we've pinned on them. Um, during the campaign, um, it, was, it was repeated a great deal that the um, Leave campaign, sorry, the Remain campaign was, was just Project Fear. It was just trying to scare people with terrifying stories. Uh, and uh, it, certainly no one admitted that they were say, stating any facts. Um, but um, um, so, uh, so is there a way to get the EU to connect with people emotionally. So uh, there's a couple of problems. Uh, I, I would be willing to bet you, I, I wouldn't have been willing to bet on the outcome of the referendum, but I'd be willing to bet you that 90% of the British public couldn't name a single grouping in the European Parliament. Um, that 90% of the British public don't know that the EU's motto is unity and diversity. Um, there's simply no discussion about what the European project is as a positive project in Britain. There's no discussion about European level politics. And there is, an, there is an important and simple democratic point, which is if I don't like the policies that the British government has, people think, I can vote it out. Right? But if I don't like the direction the EU is going, I have no power over that. that or that's, that's how they perceive things. And it's true that uh, there is no you know, European election campaign that has mani manifestos that are worth reading and that, and that you, know, you can see clearly which direction 
the uh, candidate would be taking the union, and, you know. Um, there's, we feel that we, there is a sense of powerlessness about um, the policies. And I think we have to have a bigger conversation about, um, about the values and about um, why... Um, so we do have to have a bigger, bigger conversation about how to have a democracy which isn't the democracy of a nation state, right? We don't have a single demos that uh, is going to get involved in one big conversation. So we have to have a conversation about what democracy means for an international uh, club, which is what the European Union is. That conversation hasn't be been had. And the European Union has to do much better at explaining how it provides citizens of the Union with control over what's going on. That's what they feel is absent. Largely because they never think about it. <laughs> but but, but we've never had, we haven't had that conversation. It's been completely neglected. And the values of the European Union have been completely neglected in terms of branding as European values, at least in Britain. I don't know, I can't speak for um, the rest of the Union. But, well, uh, what makes sense is democracy. Uh, the European Union budget uh, redistributes 1% of the GDP. Uh, nation states, 30%, 40%, sometimes 50% of the GDP is redistributed. Uh, which means that you cannot expect the same level of democracy um, uh, for, a, for an entity which uh, has a very minuscule redistributive effect. Its legislative impact is greater, but as the legislative as well as the budgetary power of um, the European Community and then Union increased, the democratic control also increased. The European Parliament was established with the Lisbon Treaty. There is more role of the directly elected European Parliament to participate in legislation. And it's never ever the unelected bureaucrats who make the law. Uh, they draft the law, but it's the Council, elected ministers getting together in Council who adopt the law, and in more and more cases with the consent of the directly elected European Parliament. So there is, of course, a kind of democratic deficit. You can always work for perfection. Um, bureaucrats are never elected either in Brussels or in London, because bureaucrats have to be appointed. Um, and um, and um, uh, I think all these uh, judgments have to be put in, uh, into the right context um, if, um, if you want a fair assessment. And then, of course, the question is who's really speaking and whose uh, democratic standards should be uh, let's say, the, the, the benchmark. Should it be a country which doesn't have a written constitution, cannot elect the head of state, doesn't have proportional representation, has an unadapted house of lords, um, and, um, and every second prime minister is also unelected? Uh, look at just what happened now. Um, a change of the prime minister without um, uh, an election, which happens um, every uh, second time uh, 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 practically. So I think uh, you know, there should be some kind of uh, fairness and modesty when, uh, when we uh, judge, let's say, the democratic standards within uh, particular uh, uh, countries and at the level of the European Union. There should be, but there isn't. So there isn't the question, how do we, how do we deal with that? Because British voters do not see these, these deficits in British democracy. They just don't see them. They only see it at the European level. Mm. Uh, can I just add one, one point to what Professor and the former Commissioner and uh, were, were saying about the UK? Um, the UK likes to think of itself as the oldest uh, demo parliamentary democracy in the world, the country that gave the world Magna Carta and so on. Um, there is some truth in, in that, but sort of with. Uh, uh, lots of qualifications. But at the moment, it's, th what's interesting is that uh, this um, referendum has been hailed as a huge democratic success. This is what one million uh, uh, difference between the vote leave and remain. And the question is, who should trigger uh, Article 50, the notification of withdrawal to the European Union, notification to the European Council there? The yeah, UK you, intends to withdraw from the European Union. And one of the options which the government at the moment it supports is that the government should rely on the so-called royal prerogative, which goes back to the Middle Ages, not written anywhere. It's a rule whereby the government, so the crown, the government in practice, can uh, enter international treaties, negotiate international treaties without the involvement of the parliament. 
Now, of course, the, the referendum was a huge question, but uh, the even larger, more momentous question is what happens next? In other words, what kind of settlement should there be with the European? And of course, um, triggering the notification requires the country to have a certain idea as to what it wants, the goal of that negotiation, the ultimate aim. Do they want to have uh, an EEA type of arrangement that we could, and we can come back to that, or which would basically mean most of uh, EU policies would apply and laws would apply to the, to the UK with the exception of the common agricultural policy and uh, the uh, common fisheries policies and some other policies, but the, the bulk of uh, um, legislation would continue to apply to the UK, including freedom of the people, or a completely different option, which would be uh, to have an ad hoc um, trade relationship which would m most likely uh, not include access to the single market if, as the government is saying, uh, the UK should uh, not uh, allow uh, migrants, so-called migrants, from the European Union. So these are e extremely important questions, but of course none of these were uh, mentioned in uh, uh, the referendum. There was no mention of what would happen in the event of a vote leave uh, campaign. And so uh, the result of this it might be, I mean there's huge constitutional discussion on this, but it might be if the government follows its legal advice, they would simply go ahead and negotiate secretly without um, you know, a race of parliament, without any mandate from parliament as to their aim of negotiation. So that's the UK side of things. Um, I'll keep it brief on, on the EU side of things. It's, it's, it's an extremely uh, complicated issue how uh, to engage the European citizens with, uh, with what the European Union does. And my, my point of view, it's, it's, that is primarily the responsibility of national politicians. And that's partly the, the problem with, with the UK, but also other countries. Because the, the politicians, as I said before, politicians uh, portray the European as something that happens to, to a country rather than, than a process that is driven forward by that country together with our other countries within the context of the European institutions, of course. Uh, there is, of course, a democratic deficit, but it's not as wide and spread as some people think. Partly because of the, the limited uh, redistributional impact, redistributive impact of um, EU policies, although that has increased uh, over the years. Um, but partly also because of the reforms that have been introduced. But the most important point is that there is no European political discourse. And I repeat again, that is primarily the responsibility of the national politicians. Who, you know, I think that's a wake-up call for, this referendum should be a wake-up call for not just the European institutions, but most importantly, national politicians. Um, we need to move on, because we have 50 minutes remaining to discuss the future of the EU. And we'll, we'll take questions after the afternoon if, if people are happy to stay. Um, stay on. I, mean, I, I, I would I would disagree with with the lack of European political discourse on what is Europe. I mean, the signing of the Treaty of Lisbon and the signing of the Treaty of Nice and the signing of the Treaty of Maastricht uh, was preceded by widespread discourses about the first couple of sentences in the in the treaties. Uh, and there's big differences between the Lisbon Treaty first couple of articles and the preamble, and and and, and, and between the the Maastricht Treaty, same provisions in the Maastricht Treaty. And I think they're very, very clear. I mean, what else would you... I mean, there was a big debate on, you know, competition yeah, being taken out as a, as a policy objective by... Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, sorry, um, uh, the French, the Sarkozy, yeah? Because competition can, must not be uh, a, social, a socially supported policy for the European Union, OK? Um, I, I do think that there has been... Some, I'm not sure what else you can high produce. Level, uh, the very, very high level, the meta level of, of what, what Europe is supposed to be about. 
Um, we'll, we'll come back to the questions, but um, let's just have a final round, okay? Final round, which is final official round of this roundtable, which regards the future of the future of, of Britain in or outside or beside beside Europe and the future of the European Union. Uh, you can raise political, constitutional, international relations, international law problems, or whatever you whatever you feel like. We're, we're looking into the future and we, we're trying to map out what's 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 in front of us. Uh, so so we keep to our customer order and, and Simon now. No, I, have, I have nothing to say. Okay. So like how staring, do you see yourself as a British citizen in Hungary? At this, at this point. Uh, yeah. Okay. You know, there's just, uns there's frankly a great deal of uncertainty. I mean, so the one thing I can say is that Theresa May was uh, quickly appointed Prime Minister yesterday, and um, um, that was a somewhat reassuring appointment. Um, but her cabinet appointments, the, the Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, and um, the Minister for Brexit, David Davis, are. Uh, deeply concerning to me, so I'm concerned that Britain will be seeking a rather distant relationship from the European Union uh, rather than rather than a, a still close one. Um, and that leaves a lot of uncertainty for, for, uh, for people like me. I mean, you know, again, about the point about democracy here, the people who had most at stake in this election yeah. were Europeans in Britain and Britons in Europe, and neither of them really had a voice in the entire referendum campaign. Many of them did not have a vote, <laughs> and that that that's so that's you know a, a very a very worrying democratic outcome in some ways. There was there was some reassurance offered by by the, by the new minister for Brexit. He said that reciprocity is going to be the new new keyword for the future arrangements, <laughs> which in a sense is you know it's something very very concrete. There haven't um, been any concrete commitments at the moment about but, future states. Uh, he, was, he was already, yeah. you know, drawing up some alternatives. And the reciprocity, I mean, from looking yeah. at from a substantial point of view, might give you the same sort of entitlements as as non-EU British citizen in living in a European country. Uh, but the problem is just it just makes the administration of of your rights much more complicated. We're going back to you know the pre-common market uh, times when 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 you know you, you could do things or, or common market times where you could do things, but then, you know, national administration was just way too burdensome. Yeah. Um, so you had rights, but you were very difficult to vindicate your, um, your, your rights. Um, so how do you see Europe, or, or Britain in Europe, or Europe, the European Union itself, uh, or the future of, 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 of Brexit? Well, first of all, I'm not worried, in a way that uh, I think this is a good opportunity that the EU starts to reform itself, because we've been facing some challenges. The, uh, the Greek debt crisis was the first a really large ex uh, example of that something is not right and uh, finally I think the Brexit will, will be a wake-up call for the EU to reform itself as well and we've been seeing some uh, some progress in it of course uh, we've, we've been revisiting the old debates whether we should be uh, European nation states or federal Europe and not surprisingly um, depending on political size the answers has been the same and even though uh, you've mentioned that there have been so many treaties signed about, signed about the uh, functioning of the European Union, it seems like that debate is still not over. Uh, we still have to revisit it and we still have to agree that what kind of European Union do we want. And this partly answers your question as well, that whether we have to bring the European Union closer to its citizens, do we have to? It depends on what kind of EU do we want. And that's, that's not over. That's, it's, it's unfinished business, as Libor Ruczek, who was the socialist uh, vice president of the European Parliament, said earlier this year. And uh, I see a good opportunity here. And uh, of course, uncertainty is there. Nobody knows that how uh, we will part ways uh, with Great Britain. But at least we might have the chance to revisit some of the fundamental questions, which still have to be answered if we want to see a, a more successful European Union. And to be honest, I do not know which sample will prevail at the end, whether we will go in a more federal way or whether we will be a, more of a contract union, because uh, we have uh, major players on both sides. But what experience tells me is that at the end of the day, uh, economic interests will prevail. So uh, we can talk about democracy, we can talk about uh, participation and so on. But to be honest, the Schengen zone was not established because the free movement of people was so precious. It was established because it was beneficial for business.
how do you see the constitutional future of, of all this? Right, or so or even legal, shall we start from <laughs> Great Britain, the United Kingdom? <laughs> with it. Um, my, my citing point is that I'm prepared to be persuaded. You know, if the facts changed, uh, I changed my mind, as Keynes once said. Uh, so if in 10 years' time Britain will be a, a successful, democratic and progressive country, that will change my mind. But at the moment, I, I, uh, the evidence points to a completely different direction. I mean, when, when you have, as has been said, economists from um, opposite sides of the uh, academic debate agreeing on something, you worry it must be, it must be correct, it must be true. If there's such a level of consensus among uh, economists that the impact on the United Kingdom is going to be overwhelmingly um, negative, at least in the short, well, short term, we should say short term, but the, the uncertainty is going to be prolonged because the negotiations are extremely complicated. The UK doesn't have um, the expertise at the moment and uh, to negotiate international trade agreements. It, it is going on a hiring spree, um, so there will be job offers for anyone with the experience of ne negotiating international treaties. Um, and these treaties, these agreements, uh, take a very long time. That's at least been the uh, experience so far, and they're very fragmented, they're, very, they're sectoral, usually they're not comprehensive. So. The major tension that I see is between the interest of the so-called economic establishment, so the city of London, and the voters who thought that they were getting back control of their borders, to use the, 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 the campaign's slogan. These two uh, are irreconcilable objectives because there is no way, at least within the existing uh, frameworks, that uh, the uh, UK can enter into a, a relationship with the European Union that involves um, having access to the single market, and most importantly for uh, its financial services it, uh, industries to have passporting rights, in other words, to be able uh, to um, um, tr trade in financial services without having to set up subsidiaries in, in uh, uh, the EU and at the same time limit um, free movement of persons. There is no such thing as the two. The two, uh, the two objectives are reconcilable at the moment, at least with, within the existing frameworks. And before uh, the elections in, in, in France and Germany, nothing is going to uh, change in terms of the ne negotiating. So we'll have to wait at least until then for the negotiations to start in earnest. Uh, the future of the European Union, that's a much uh, broader question. I agree that it could be a, a, a po end up being a positive development, although the uncertainty is going to unfortunately affect the rest of the European Union as well. Um, to go back to what Martin was saying about the political di discourse, yes, there was discussion about um, uh, crucial um, issues relating to the uh, Lisbon Treaty, but that discussion was, I was trying to suggest, at a high level that wasn't really uh, um, something that hit the headlines, something that ordinary citizens could relate to, and that's the real challenge of Europe. It's an incredibly complex organisation. It needs to uh, find a way to, to communicate uh, its achievements, its objectives, its values to, to citizens, and uh, as I said before, uh, unless the national politicians are on board, that's not going to happen. So do you see an issue with conflict between British economic and industrial policy and the actual outcome of this 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 vote that Britain has consciously embarked upon a route of opening up the national economy, opening up to globalization? I'm talking about post Thatcher, and now the 
the, the population wants to go back before, before the 80s, before the 70s, or well, they want a selective open and closed economy and open and closed society. Be, you know, London remained the centre of the world, yeah, the financial world and the world, uh, but the rest of Britain, I mean, this is, I'm being very ironic, uh, the rest of Britain remains this rural, parochial, sort of, sort of, sort of backwater land when, when no immigration, no impact of globalisation. Um, I mean, do, do you see this? Obviously, you don't see this as realistic because you were talking about this conflict between, uh, between the desire of having an open economy with, with, with leading industries, global leading industries based in England, and then having a, a country which can just shut down its borders and, and you know, ignore, you know, globalisation. It's very sim uh, sorry, uh, it's very similar to the last last summer's event in in Hungary that uh, we're part of the European Union and we're part of the global global order, and then we you know we try to shut down our southern borders. Uh, um, we yeah. were in the same sort of, um, sort of split, split identity or split, split understanding of, of, of what is happening. Yeah, I, I mentioned that, that the overwhelming consensus, uh, I think Professor Ander mentioned that as well, uh, among economists. There was one exception, Professor Patrick Minford, who uh, believes that uh, manufacturing will have to disappear from, from the United Kingdom. And for him that's a positive thing, positive development. So it could go that that way, but uh, uh, I don't think that the voters uh, uh, from Sunderland and the other industrial parts or former industrial parts of, of the United Kingdom actually signed up for that kind of scenario. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, other, there's just one comment, and then we, we, we move on to Professor Ondo, is that taking back control of the slogan is, is very similar to you know subsidiarity as a political concept, which was in a sense British, it wasn't British invented, but the British insisted that it, 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 it was going to be introduced in the Maastricht Treaty, if I'm, if I'm correct. So it's, it's very, very similar discourse. And I suppose Europe can respond with more subsidiarity. Uh, but the problem with more subsidiarity, I suppose, is that, that again, it is places responsibilities on national governments. And I think we came to the conclusion that, that most of the failings of, of Europe in Britain were the failings of the, of the British government, I, I, I suppose, certainly in the northern, northern, northern regions of Britain. But you could say the same thing, same, same thing about eastern Hungary or, 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 or southern Hungary, that the failures are primarily connected to the, to the government. So if we respond with more subsidiarity, uh, we give back more control. The responsibility also goes with the control. And I'm not sure that we can actually trust you know, national governments, not even well-organized governments like, like the British or reasonably well-organized governments. Um, I'm not suggesting that federalization is the way out, certainly. Um, um, what, what do you think? Federalization or more subsidiarity or trusting national governments more? What, what would be the solution? Well, um, first of all, what can say is the relation between the UK and, um, and, uh, and the rest of the European Union. I think um, at the end of the day, if we are all lucky, uh, there will be just a very small difference between saying that this is the United Kingdom, member of the European Union with a lot of opt-outs, and on the other hand, this is the United Kingdom, not member of the European Union, but with a lot of special access uh, to the remaining uh, EU. So we may end up in a situation where the actual difference between the two uh, will be really small. Of course, one is member of the EU, the other one is non-member of the EU, so you can choose between Norway or Switzerland. But, as we already heard, uh, there will be a crucial question on this road, which is um, whether uh, the British people or the British government would accept um, that the freedom of movement is inseparable from the single market because then it will uh, decide uh, uh, whether it's Norway, Switzerland on the one hand, or it is Turkey, Serbia, uh, or, or Canada um, model on, 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 on the other. Now, um, uh, kind of reforming and its, the, the possible directions. Um, I think it very much depends on keeping or not keeping the single currency. I think the single currency will be kept, um, and uh, if, if that's uh, a, a political commitment, um, there is, of course, a limitation um, uh, uh, to the extent uh, subsidiarity uh, uh, can, can, can function and can uh, 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 continue. Uh, quite the contrary. I mean, since 2012, four presidents' report, recently five presidents' report, um, and many other documents uh, uh, kind of explain that uh, the fundamental uh, misconception in the Maastricht Treaty is that you launch the monetary union without a fiscal union and the political union. 
And um, you know, in the last few years, um, there has been a lot of reparation, uh, an ESM, a banking union. Um, so there have been many, many items added to reinforce uh, the EMU and make it more sustainable and resilient. Uh, but of course, this is just the sign. This is just the start. Um, and of course, this has to be uh, accelerated um, if we want to um, overcome uh, the current uh, uh, problems, especially on the Eurozone periphery. But in more general terms, the fact that the Eurozone uh, has been in a stagnation for much uh, too long than, uh, than acceptable uh, would necessitate a faster reform. Um, the recent um, uh, kind of um, elaborations, including uh, one paper which was signed by two foreign ministers, uh, the German and the French, identify three key areas where the reforms should go ahead within the existing treaty, because we need faster uh, improvement in performance than a, a treaty change can happen, um, which is uh, the issue of security on the one hand, we need greater security, especially vis-a-vis -vis terrorism and its consequences, uh, migration and asylum, and number three, the economic and monetary union. So in these three areas, if the citizens can't see uh, some convincing steps to improve coordination and performance and the outcomes, obviously we will uh, risk uh, a, a chain reaction from uh, the UK uh, referendum and other referendums. Thank you very much. Uh, there's there's one more there's one pending question. If you oh, okay, thank you. Uh, I can uh, uh, believe uh, the question. What what's the message, if any, for the for the European Union that that Mr. Johnson was a uh, 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 enthusiastic protagonist of, of Brexit and became a, a, a member in a very, in a key position uh, in the uh, British government. See, that is been it, it it will be entertaining. <laughs> That's, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's going to be entertaining. I'm totally convinced. Anybody longer, longer response, perhaps? No. <laughs> I would naturally overestimate the nomination of Boris Johnson as the head of the Foreign Office, because neither of the trade, neither trade agreements nor Brexit will be his responsibility. So he might fly around a lot. He might fraternize with Vladimir Putin, whatever he wants, to, uh, whoever, whoever he wants with. He will get a frequent flyer card, whatever he wants. But uh, I don't think that he will be the most influential player when it becomes about Brexit. Those because there's a state secretary to handle that, and we have a very experienced prime minister to handle that. But of course, as a not as a consolation prize, but as reaching out for the other side, like uh, part of the One Nation cast that the, the new prime minister was talking about last night, he had uh, she had to bring some Brexiteers to her government to put the party together once again. Before we close this roundtable discussion, are there any more short questions from, from the audience? Nobody? Nobody? And I would like to thank you for your, for your patience and your, and your attention. Uh, I'd like to thank our panellists for, for, for these engaging and I think very, very stimulating, stimulating talks. I'm still very confused. Uh, I'm still very confused, and I'm still very sad, and uh, I'm still very angry. I have to say I'm very angry. Uh, but this is nothing personal. It's, um, uh, so thank you very much. I hope everybody enjoyed it, and, and this will be for, available on, on the Institute's YouTube channel. And I think this is our formal, final formal event uh, before the summer, which, well, this is the summer already. Um, so my colleagues, I hope to see you in September, and uh, everybody else, I hope to see you around at future events uh, at this Center and Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.